Welcome to a new edition of New Energy for Europe, a regular news program that gives an insight into the adaptation and implementation of green hydrogen policies all over Europe. Our bulletins are meant for anyone who wants to follow the energy transition. On the edge of Europe and Asia lies Georgia, a mountainous country just east of the Black Sea. Georgia has big plans with renewable hydrogen produced at the sites of hydrogen power stations. Hydrogen power stations capture the energy of falling water to generate electricity. The Georgian government wants to explore the country's potential for generating green hydrogen through electrolyzers near dams. The context is that Georgia is uh, absolutely blessed with abundant hydropower. Um, it's 80% it's of its domestic electricity generation. However, this is a very seasonal resource in nature because there's excess generation in the summer. So the Georgian government, realizing that water currently is spilled during the summer months and electricity or alternatively electricity is exported at low prices, it would be put to better use producing hydrogen. Georgia has asked the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the EBRD, to help explore the possibilities and have been accepted. So the, this project, the one that we are supporting, could potentially become um, a regional milestone in exploring synergies between decarbonized fuel production and the existing transportation infrastructure. That means existing pipelines would be able to carry the hydrogen gas blended with natural gas. The quick developments in this field are amazing, says Ms. Ida Sitdikova, director and head of EBRD's Energy Eurasia. What we are seeing that despite COVID, things are evolving so fast. Green hydrogen a year ago was a bit futuristic, even um, across, you know, even more advanced countries. What we're seeing now is that things are changing, electrolyzers are becoming cheaper, there's capacity built up. There are projects with gigawatts of renewable energy to convert. Um, and yes, Eurasia might be the next hub of green hydrogen. That might sound all new and innovative, but linking electrolyzers, which make hydrogen from green electricity and water, to hydrogen power is already happening in another European mountainous country, in Switzerland. Here, dozens of hydrogen-powered trucks are on the road. H2 Energy Chairman Mr. Rolf Huber has a first. He succeeded in the market introduction of fuel cell trucks, and there will be more, many more. Yeah, we have close to 50 trucks in Switzerland, but we think it cannot be too high of a number if we, if we, if we are aiming for a few thousand. So I would say, and that's why we actually are very positive to be able to, to, to sell uh, between 1,000 and 2,000 trucks relatively easy in the Swiss, into the Swiss market. Initially, it wasn't easy to find buyers. They were a bit hesitant about committing to such a novelty, while lacking the opportunity to see and test the trucks. But then, when the first trucks had arrived, uh, I mean, it really boomed. And, uh, and we, were, we were like, a few days afterwards, we were fully sold out. We also see that, and I find that very refreshing, uh, you know, you're talking to this fleet manager, to the high management, but then you see basically uh, while doing business that the real decision makers are actually the truck drivers. Those are the guys. Yeah. So those are the guys. And when the fleet manager uh, recognized that these guys like the truck, then they're all in. Currently, hydropower, so the energy of falling water, produces all of the electricity needed for the hydrogen gas production. It's a market of supply and demand. But I must say the, the, you know, the problematic side is that the, the potential of further hydropower installation is, uh, is, is quite limited, at least in Switzerland. Um, so we see when it comes to, to, uh, to, to the Green Deal or full decarbonization, um, we see actually that, that, that um, offshore wind parks are uh, you know, kind of the source of renewable energy. Uh, that we have to get connected with. That's interesting. When it comes to green hydrogen availability, even in Switzerland, they are, in the end, looking towards the seas and oceans. The ballpark will have to be coming from wind power. Beneath the water of the North Sea, 
deep underground, there are large empty spaces, salt caverns, that provide giant capacities for storing of energy in the form of gas molecules. The hydrogen generated in and around the water parks can be kept here, before being transported to the user markets. Scientists are dealing with research questions like how can this be done efficiently and safely? Beneath European waters, and especially the North Sea, large amounts of hydrogen generated by offshore wind farms could be stored. There would be no just one cavern. You are going to have hundreds of them. You are going to have many of them. There are caverns already there for different purposes, for natural gas storage, so it's not a completely new topic, especially in Europe and in the Netherlands, we have a deposition of rock salt, we call them a Zechstein salt rock depositions that can be utilized for storage of hydrogen. But science still faces some important challenges. There are two major challenges here, uh, scientific opportunities. One is to turn what we have today to hydrogen-based storage. Another is to develop new caverns uh, speci you know, specialized for the usage of hydrogen storage. Questions like how will the salt rock react when placed under high and fluctuating pressure? How would the salt rock behave and not only the peas, but also the entire system when other caverns are also being cycled? So in a system look, you want to optimize the entire cluster of them. We would like to see the inside part of this salt rock and see how it looks different after many, many cycles of, of loading. This picture actually shows a cyclic uh, usage of a salt cavern for storage of hydrogen, so increasing and decreasing the pressure as we produce and, and inject hydrogen. And then in here you see the deformation of the salt rock layer due to this pressurization. And that's the analytical and computational approach that we do in order to optimize the storage efficiency and also uh, maintain the safety. Wind Europe is the voice of the wind energy industry. It's common knowledge wind turbines onshore and offshore produce renewable electricity. So Wind Europe believes that the number one green ambition should be to electrify as many energy systems as possible. This means, for example, electrifying mobility, transport and heating in buildings. Now, that's great, but we can't electrify everything. We think in Wind Europe we can electrify about 62% of the energy system, but that leaves 38% we cannot electrify. So how do you decarbonize that 38%? Renewable hydrogen is a big part of the answer. So which sectors are hard to electrify? Which sectors are we talking about? Yeah, we're talking about heavy industry, refineries, petrochemicals, parts of chemicals, other parts of heavy industry we're talking about heavy duty transport yep trucks maybe shipping renewable hydrogen not only helps in buffering balancing and transporting wind power it delivers another big advantage booming prospects because far offshore floating wind turbines in combination with hydrogen gas production could open the door to the real massification it's going to need to be floating offshore wind but this technology has come of age already. The challenge now is to scale up to the large floating offshore wind farms, but that is going to happen in the next 10 years. So with such a promising outlook, could Europe one day be energy self-sufficient, according to Mr. Giles Dixon? We have the potential to produce huge quantities of renewable hydrogen from renewables in Europe using electrolyzers made in Europe. We do not need to be importing this from, from far afield. In future decades, will Europe still need to import any energy at all, fossil or renewable, from other countries like Russia or Saudi Arabia? It's an important issue, also from a geopolitical point of view. Here we already see some interesting opposite opinions. So we asked Mr. Rob Devaik, head of the Hague Centre for Strategic Studies. Now, so the big question is, where do you produce hydrogen? Mr. De Vijk says he's realistic about it. it it's unavoidable. Uh, you have no other choice but to think also about importing energy. Now, the funny thing is that you want to become less dependent from Saudi Arabia 
because of this, uh, because of this transformation, you, you will become more dependent uh, on Saudi Arabia. So you have to accept that importing solar energy in the form of hydrogen will make Western markets dependent on the Middle East again. But what about Russia? Oh well, uh, Russia could be could be the big loser of this game. It's too dependent on natural gas and oil exports. And there's another level where you have to make compromises for the sake of the end goal, according to Mr. Devike. Green is the objective, but blue hydrogen production might very well be part of the plan. Blue hydrogen is created using fossil energy sources, but the carbon emissions are captured and stored. You, you have to accept that you, have, that you need in-between steps, such as the production, maybe, of hydrogen with natural gas. Uh, I'm not in favor of that uh, as well, but if you need it as an in-between step to come to a real uh, a green economy, then in my view, you have to do that. We are joined now by the Secretary General of Hydrogen Europe, Mr. Jorgo Chachimakakis. Hydrogen Europe represents the European industry, national associations and research centers active in the hydrogen and fuel cell sector. So, you gotta go just... so how do you approach these issues? Do you regard blue hydrogen as part of the transition? Well, first of all, the hydrogen that is used today is the so-called grey hydrogen, uh, which stems from fossil energy but has a bad footprint. We need to replace that. And if we reduce the carbon content of grey hydrogen by more than 60%, that's already an achievement. And that is blue hydrogen. Blue hydrogen is basically starting now, immediately. And um, that's why it is needed when it comes to the immediate effect of hydrogen on the decarbonization. Um, long term, most probably blue hydrogen will not survive unless it gets higher rates of decarbonization than 90%. So do you understand the, the criticism that blue hydrogen is a fossil fuel industry greenwash? I can fully understand that um, the civil society, and it's a very important voice that is raised there, um, has concerns that any investment into blue hydrogen uh, would cause this lock-in effect, which means you invest now and then you want to keep it forever, and that means you want to keep fossil hydrogen in the game. And that I can understand. However, if we go for a sunset clause, so if we go for a solution which forbids hydrogen that is low performing, blue hydrogen that is low performing after 2030, it goes without saying that these investments do not make any sense. So this means there will be no login effect, but at the same time, if we use that blue now, there will be an immediate effect on decarbonization the next 10 years. That's what we are going uh, to ask for. That's what we are going to discuss also with these NGOs and with the civil society, because the concern is absolutely understood. Another sensitive topic, will green hydrogen imports create a new other dependency on countries like Saudi Arabia? Well, first of all, it is a major achievement that we can replace fossil energy like coal, like oil, like gas with hydrogen. That's a major achievement. So if we want to go there, if we want really to replace everything with hydrogen, with clean hydrogen, renewable hydrogen, we need to import because uh, the, renewable, mm, the re renewable energy harvest that we can get from uh, Europe uh, and the European continent is not enough. So we need to go to sun rich areas like the north of Africa, uh, but also the Saudi Arabian, the Arabian sorry, Peninsula. And it was very encouraging to listen to Saudi Arabia as the host of the last G20 summit, which said something which was a sensation for many people. Saudi Arabia said they will stop working with oil, with crude oil. They will now produce hydrogen and some derivatives of hydrogen, like ammonia or like synthetic fuels, but based on renewable hydrogen in order to replace fossil. That's great. That means that we will get our hydrogen from our old client, from our old sources like Saudi Arabia, but also from new sources. There will be new countries that will deliver hydrogen in a, in a very high extent. 
take Portugal. Portugal will, will become a giant. Uh, the future shakes will be from Portugal and not anymore from, from the Arab world. So mm -hmm. what we need to do, of course, because it is a geostrategic issue, to diversify our sources. And that makes us strong and resilient, even if we switch from fossil to hydrogen. So I don't see this as a criticism. I see this as an encouragement to really have a resilient and diversified uh, supply of hydrogen. Jordo Chitsimakakis, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for watching the show. Within one or two weeks, you can expect our next edition. Sign up on the website to be notified about this and drop your ideas for future programs. This is newenergyforeurope.com.